Our next speaker this morning uh, needs no introduction. He is the very reason we are all here uh, gathered. Uh, Bob Cohn is professor of physics and professor of philosophy emeritus here at Boston University. Uh, he, uh, more importantly, is the co-founder, along with the late Mark Swartovsky, of this Center for the Philosophy and History of Science. He served as director of the center for 33 years and is now director emeritus. He is also the founder of the book series Boston Studies in the Philosophy of Science, which is published by Springer, and he has edited over 100 books in the history and philosophy of science. He is a member of the Institute Vienna Circle, where a copy of the Robert S. Cohen archives resides. He has also established a library at Tsinghua University in Beijing, in China. And he will be speaking to us today about founding the center and the Boston Studies series. Please join me in welcoming Professor Cohn. Well, this is a historical moment, as you will see in a moment. Uh, living history, by which I mean the historical people, except for Philip Frank, are here. Gerald Holton, Ernan McMullen, Abner Shimoni, John Stachel. These are historical figures, and they're here. And we'll hear them, and you can argue with them, as I do. Um, the inter-university discussion group that Jerry Holton has talked about was my first introduction to Philip Frank. Of course, I met him at a Bickford cafeteria, uh, a corner cafeteria at Harvard Square, which he converted into a Viennese cafe. And the corner of that cafeteria was known as Philip Frank's Corner. And that's how I met him. I didn't know he was a big shot. I, I thought of him as a, a cafe hanger on. Actually, the Institute for the Unity of Science, which had been founded more or less in a sloppy way by Otto Neurath in Vienna, uh, continued in, in the Netherlands when the Nazis took over. And then when the Nazis took over, the Netherlands continued in, in a little way in Oxford, where Otto Neurath luckily was able to emigrate. And then Although Otto didn't join Philip here in the States, except for certain visits, he had not stayed at any length of time in the States. Uh, Otto uh, pretty much appointed Philip to carry on the Institute for the Unity of Science, which had a contract with the University of Chicago Press to publish a series of books, an encyclopedia of the Unity of Science, which some of you will know, a classic source. Not quite up to the level of Diderot, but nevertheless an encyclopedia of all the sciences and the humanities, including a passionately wonderful little essay by John Dewey on values. Not exactly from Vienna, but there it was, a link to America. A classic statement about the nature of probability by Ernest Nagel is one of the chapters Leaf, uh, little books in that encyclopedia. Well, the Institute for the Unity of Science had the legal ownership of that project and had a small income. And I was, uh, I was very young then, and Philip had invited me to give a paper on how to teach physics to humanities students. You may all remember the phrase, physics for poets. I didn't quite invent that phrase, but I ran with it. And uh, so I, I became known for that. And I became, as Jerry Holton would say, a kind of manager or secretary of the Institute, which took over that, that inter-scientific inter reading group. And we met in different places. This is running now into the 40s and early 50s. We met in different places, Boston College, Boston University, Tufts, Brandeis, Harvard, MIT, and uh, it was a little, little bit of a problem how to manage getting a room like this 
and or not like this, not as elegant as this, e even getting a classroom assigned for these meetings. And a little bit of a problem inviting not such an august he heavenly host as Jerry Holton has read to us, but pretty heavenly anyway. We had a number of angels. And uh, at one point, my beloved colleague, Mark Swartowski, in the philosophy department here at BU, and I offered to be the host of the meetings of that inter-university, inter-scientific, inter-everything group. Uh, we'll, we'll meet at BU regularly. We'll have a regular room. We won't have the hassle of organizing. And won't you all come? Well, that's what happened. That's how it started. There was no decision to make a center at BU. In fact, we didn't have a budget. That's terribly important, which I will not say much about, but it, it, it was a, a, a no-budget institution. Oh, how I envy now, and for many years, uh, those institutions that had, had endowments. When you think of the marvelous endowment at our sister institution, particularly at Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, for many years, the real center of philosophy of science and philosophy of science research and gathering uh, for the world, they have an endowment. And Herbert Feigl, that, and that's under the leadership of Adolf Grinbaum. And Herbert Feigl had such an endowment at Minnesota. We didn't have one. What we had was an agreement to have a room and half-time assistant, uh, graduate student assistant. So we, we, we went along on everybody's contribution, by which I want to say just a word, as I did in April. Uh, one of our techniques for continuing the group, and some of you will remember this, was to have a Chinese dinner bef before the colloquium met. Uh, at Chef Chang's on Beacon Street. You can walk there. It's no longer there. It closed last week, I think, after so many decades. And uh, we met at Chef Chang's for dinner, and everybody who was invited, and good many who were not invited, but came anyway, met at Chef Chang's, and everyone paid for their own dinner except for the speaker. Uh, and after a, after a happy dinner at Chef Chang, at which uh, Chef Chang, the man, w would greet us, and they had a way in which when we had a, a Peking duck, he would do the slicing and we would all cheer. So we were already cheering and applauding before we got the meeting and uh, argued about the topic of the meeting over dinner, over dinner and drinks and then adjourned to Boston University where students and others were gathered to greet the speaker and the speaker's commentators and the speaker's following all the fans from the dinner party. So it was a, a, a kind of, not weekly, but bi-weekly on the same day of the week most of the time, every Thursday evening, every other Thursday evening, uh, there was the Boston Colloquium. Now the Colloquium, um, let me say that the Institute for the Unity of Science faded into two organizations. One is this one, sitting right here, and the other is the Philosophy of Science Association, PSA. And we made a decision, we, the directors of the Institute, that's Philip Frank, Ernest Nagel, Milton Konvitz from Cornell University, I think Van Quine was with us in this, but I'm not sure, and me. We voted to give the resources of the Institute to the Philosophy of Science Association. So the PSA, which is an American organization with international members, of course, but uh, mostly American, is really the legal successor to the Institute. Part of the succession turned out to be that when we began the Boston Studies in Philosophy of Science, uh, th on three occasions, a volume of the Boston Studies was devoted to the proceedings, the edited proceedings of the Philosophy of Science Association meeting of that 
they met every two years uh, of, of that meeting. And that occurred three times. It's not generally remembered. Well, no reason to it. But the, the, the first three published proceedings of the PSA were volumes of the Boston Studies. This is in the 60s. So the executive committee voted ourselves out of existence. The money was transferred to PSA. Uh, and the journal, Philosophy of Science, which had been founded in the early 30s by William Mal Malisoff, that journal was enabled to continue by virtue of Otto Neurath and Philip Frank's institute as transferred to America. And the, the, the interest, not the interest, the, the, the income from the Institute for the Unity of Science publications went to the PSA. Um, what's very crucial f to learn from Philip Frank, and I think it's really terribly important in understanding philosophy of science at BU, was one aspect of Philip that Holton has put forth so generously and repeatedly over the years. Namely, he was open, open to different points of view. He wrote on relativism with sympathy for those who criticized it. He wrote on how to explain religious views for those who were religious. He was not completely an enemy, he was a friend. And of course, what does one say? It's easy to say it. A friend tells you the truth about yourself. A friend doesn't attack you. A friend tries to understand you. He was open. He reached out and he did it wonderfully. And that spirit came over to us. My colleague, Mark Swartowski, and I adopted a kind of a motto, enlarged the scope of philosophy, including of philosophy of science. Find out how science is done in other cultures, in other countries, in other periods of history, in other attitudes and other epistemologies. There's not just one epistemology, although there may be only one in Vienna. Of course, in Vienna, there was also reactionary Catholic fascism. And there also was the Anschluss, with a, in Vienna, a massive adherence to the Nazis. So it's possible to have a philosophy of science with integrity in a context which is not general American democracy. It's possible to be a Carnap or a Reichenbach. It's possible to be a philosopher in difficult times. Well, beyond professional philosophy, we had an administrative way of doing this. I mean of carrying out this purpose, which was to invite people who were professionally not philosophers. And I mean more than physicists. Uh, I made a little list, medical doctors, all kinds of religious leaders, rabbis, imams, all kinds of priests. Oh, I've got to tell that little story. At one point, we were holding a meeting at the Dominican House of Studies uh, in a suburb of Boston. And uh, Erlen, I've forgotten the name of the priest who was the organizer. Uh, anyway, I was talking to the pr organizer, and I said to him, you know, the Boston Colloquium, we try to have all kinds of people speaking, atheists, believers, uh, musicians. He said, oh, musicians. Uh, and then he says, well, we have all kinds of people, too. And I said, well, looking around this room, all I see are black people wearing black cassocks. I only see priests. He says, yes, but we have Jesuits. <laughs> he says, to have Dominicans and Jesuits doing philosophy of science with, with Bob Cohen <laughs> in the chair, that was open. And we had many rabbis. Could you be rational? and a rabbi. And some rabbi said, of course not. You have to be a Hasidic dancer. You're not supposed to be a philosopher or a thinker. You're supposed to dance. Well, that's good for the Hasids. But what about the philosophers? We got many rabbis, and there's a wonderful book called Rational Rabbis by one of our Israeli participants. Oh, we asked all kinds of literary, literary people, artists, economists, sociologists, psychologists, and psychiatrists, and poets. 
We had a wonderful colloquium, and I'll mention other wonderful colloquia in a moment, a wonderful colloquium devoted entirely to Gravity's Rainbow. You know, those of you who know that book, how difficult and deep and puzzling and wonderful that book is. And we devoted a colloquium not only to the social context of the book, but the content of the book. We had bridges, bridges I think is the metaphor for the colloquium, bridges of understanding across, across all kinds of gaps. Tough meeting points, I would call them. Tough, difficult, hard to see a logical positivist and a Hegelian in the same, around the same table. And we did have a splendid colloquium on Hegel and the sciences and a volume of Boston Studies devoted to it. It turns out that chemistry is the main, in that book, chemistry is the main natural science for which Hegelian dialectic and Hegelian metaphysics are appropriate ways of interpreting. But never mind that. The point was to bring Hegel under the, under the umbrella of what was known, of course, in European language as rational reconstruction of the enemy, always of the opponent. Whether you rationally reconstructed your own philosophy is another matter. Uh, I, I do want to press, oh, I should make a footnote. Everything I say in all the papers and all the texts that have remained are on deposit in the Howard Gottlieb Archival Research Center, the Gottlieb Research Archives here at BU, up to the point at which I stopped being the director. And that has tapes and transcripts of some of the great names I'm going to read to you. So there is a kind of, uh, kind of history in the reality uh, of a documentation. I want to add something else uh, about the beginnings. We, was hel we were helped by so many good colleagues. It was not the creation of Mark Swartowski and Bob Cohen. We were really secretarial, except I have to praise Mark Swartowski. Uh, to my mind, he was fabulous fabulous thinker, uh, a man of all seasons and all fields, a good violinist, a good political thinker, a good academic leader, a marvelous writer. Uh, it's a great tragedy that he died so early. Well, our, our names of people who helped in the leadership, I would put Adolf Greenbaum, a Greenbaum uh, who published his classic book, no longer an active classic, but was a classic book, Philosophical Problems of, of, of Physical Science, uh, became so big that it was almost a cube, and it was known popularly as the Greenbaum's Cubic Book. Uh, and he was called, for about 10 years, Mr. Space and, Mr. Space and Time was a wonderful thing for him. Um, now he was a kind of grandfather of this colloquium and supported us by visits, not by money, I must say, <laughs> but intellectually and friendship. So more power to him where he is in Pittsburgh. Uh, the Pittsburgh Center began the same year as we did and the Pittsburgh Center uh, is, is, as I say, the place to go. But among those who supported this, let me name a few, Hillary Putnam from the beginning, Van Quine from the beginning, I.B. Cohen, Bernard Cohen, the historian specialist on Newton, and his splendid student, Everett Mendelssohn, Israel Scheffler, Herbert Feigl, Oh, Marjorie Green, uh, Stephen Toulman, Dirk Struick, the historian of mathematics and geometry, uh, Paul Feyerabend, these names begin to resonate for me, I hope for you, nor would Russell Hansen with his splendid original work on the place of uh, constructivism in f theoretical physics 
Ray Seeger with his work on Mach and, and so on. Should I mention Ernan McMullen, smiling at me from the second row? From the beginning, we must go back six decades, not just five. I can't imagine you not in a priest's uniform. There you are looking like a real man. <laughs> and I learned the difference between appearance and reality. He was a real man, a real philosopher, and a lovable man. Ruth Barkin Marcus, Ruth Marcus, known for her arguments with Quine on modal logic, they were arguments here at the Boston Colloquium. Another famous person whom everyone should know, maybe you don't anymore, was Imre Lakatosh. Uh, and Lakatosh gave his major lectures in a series of several weeks here at Boston University. We almost got him to stay with us permanently, uh, but London School of Economics and Popper and John Watkins prevailed. Uh, of course, there's no doubt that from the nearly the beginning, we had Abner Shimoni. I have to say Abner, who's in the front row, uh, right in front of me, that we were so lucky that MIT did not let you teach physics and philosophy with full support, and we did. And we made a home for Abner, and what a home he made. He's a good example when someone asks you, is the universe friendly? Is the universe a home? And the answer is, if you make it. Abner made it. Another, Abner uh, was joined in the physics department here, physics and philosophy, joined in the physics department by Armand Siegel, who had been working with, with uh, a number of people on quantum theory. Sam Schwaber, oh, Lotzi Tisa, the wonderful teacher of thermodynamics, uh, Hungarian who went to MIT and became a strong supporter of our, of our colloquium. Then in, in neurology, I was trying to think of the vast number of medical people, but especially I want to mention Dr. Norman Geschwind uh, and his work on, on the brain. And here, here at Boston University, Steve Grossberg in his work on the uh, theoretical understanding of the, of the mind and the brain. I should mention Bert Drebin, of course. Um, from our own theological faculty, uh, perhaps the one most supportive was Lee Rauner. Uh, well, th that's, that's a list of some of the people uh, who supported us from the beginning, and I've left out some. Oh, I do want to mention another factor. Uh, Marx and I were chairs, chair people of one or department or another at any given time. I chaired the physics department for, I don't know, 13 years maybe? John Stachel would remember. Oh, John Stachel's sitting right here. Uh, I was here before you came. And, uh, um, and Marx, and then I at one point chaired the philosophy department. And at another point, Marx Watowski became chair of the philosophy department. So we were chairing a lot of things, and we were hiding the expenses of the colloquium under the chairman's umbrella. But uh, I wanted to mention that I always had, as I remember, I always had fantastic secretarial assistants. There are not many women's names in the list that I just read, and I, I regret that I can't go beyond the early years. So I only mentioned Marjorie Green, I think, two minutes ago. But I had fabulous assistants. They might be called secretaries. I don't know what the assistants. I just want to mention some names of people who are now, who were assistants, and almost all, they've either died or become professors. <laughs> That's the choice. Yeah. One, one of them is here today. Anyway, let me just name them. Deborah Wilkes, Betsy McCoy, Carolyn Fawcett, 
Katie Platt, Barbara Rocky, and Deborah Nails, who's sitting right over there, who's now a professor at Michigan State. Katie Platt is a professor at Babson, uh, and, and on and on. Uh, these were wonderful intellectually stimulating assistants, associates. I think much of the work of the colloquium, by saying much, I don't know whether that's 20% or 50%, much of the work of the colloquium, not just the having of it, but the organizing, the intellectual nerve of the colloquium was contributed by critical work by these extraordinary women. Barbara Rocky became a, an official of one of the major American trade unions. Silber hated her. Uh, now, I was thinking of, <laughs> I, I wanted to read to you the names of contributors just to the first year. And you'll see why this was an important event. The very first speaker was, was Carl Hempel. February 9th, 1961. Then R.S. Peters, then Mario Bunge, who was one of our supporters and still an active philosopher, then Israel Scheffler. Then, we're still in the first year, uh, Satoshi Watanabe, this marvelous applied mathematician and philosopher. Eric Lennenberg, uh, in Epistemology of Psychology. Laszlo Tisa, in his first major paper on the conceptual structure of physics. Ruth Barkin Marcus with commentator Willard Van Orman Klein. Adolf Greenbaum, his first major paper on the falsifiability of theories. Noam Chomsky on perception, language and, per and, and perceptual schemes with Sidney Morganbesser as his commentator. Then Giorgio de Santiana. I gave a paper in December 62 as a result, and this leads to my next topic, as a result of my work and visit in Poland, where, by the way, I met uh, again John Stachel. In Poland, in the 60s, I gave a paper on then current philosophy of science in Poland. That was followed by Nelson Goodman, uh, George Schlesinger, and then a major paper in logic by Hao Wang. Now, Hao Wang is a marvelous gir girdle interpreter, but a marvelous independent, was an independent mathematician on his own. And when I've been in China four or five times and mentioned that I knew Hao Wang, there's immediate bowing in my direction. You knew Hao Wang? Yeah, tell us. Don't tell us about, uh, about the Vienna Circle. Tell us about how Wang. Then he was followed by Jacob Bronowski, Wolfgang Jorgrau. Oh, in March 19th, 1963, a paper from Matter to Mass by Ernan McMullen, commentator Mark Skortowski. Of the two, I think it's hard to know who came out on Tom, uh, but Ernan's right here. He can tell us. Followed by Wilfred Sellers. George Thompson, and then a classic meeting, I'm gonna stop pretty soon about meetings, uh, a classic meeting at which Hilary Putnam offered his examination of Greenbaum's philosophy of geometry. Commentators Joseph Epstein of Amherst and Greenbaum himself. This was followed in a wonderful joke in the history of philosophy of science by Greenbaum's rebuttal of the, when we published this, uh, he rebutted Putnam's long article, I think the article was 45 pages, with a 90-page rebuttal. <laughs> so that became a classic. Then finally, I'll stop with the ne next session. I'm only up to 1963. Jerry Letvin. If you don't know the name Jerome Letvin, you're missing something. Commentator B.F. Skinner. So that was a classic. Then Norwood Russell Hansen, Everett Mendelssohn, whose commentator was Ernst Meyer on explanation 
in 19th century biology. Then an, another one on explanation with the very significant Australian philosopher, uh, Jack Smart, JJC Smart. Then Jack Finn Follesdahl, who's still an eminent Norwegian philosopher uh, at Stanford and Oslo, uh, on quantification into causal contexts. A striking topic and a striking paper. Then one of my absolute favorites, because he's the speaker is a beloved friend of mine, Herbert Marcuse, gave a paper on Husserl in Husserl's, on Husserl's critique of science in the, 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 the last major book of Husserl, The Crisis of European Sciences. And he was criticized by the major Husserlian advocate in the United States at that time, Aaron Gurvich of the New School. This, is a, this should be a well-known uh, inter, interaction above all. Um, then Abner Shimoni, March 3rd, 1964, a Whiteheadian interpretation of the foundations of quantum mechanics. How many people know that? <laughs> Abner, have you forgotten it? <laughs> He's forgotten it. Uh, my old friend, now dead, a, a blind scholar named Norman Rudich, a literary scholar, gave a paper on the difference between scientific and literary language and their overlap. A wonderful paper. And then the Dominican, whose name I forgot five minutes ago, Michael Stock uh, gave a paper on methodology in Aquinas and Freud. Very interesting comparative analysis. And uh, finally, Milich Chopik at Boston University gave a paper on the, uh, a well-known title, The Myth of Frozen Passage, or The Status of Becoming in Physics. Well. Shall I go on? It would take another hour or two to get to 1967, which I will not do. Um, now, just a few remembrances of topics which inspired me in these early years. We had a a pioneering symposium, I think it's on the epistemology of homosexuality, but I'm not sure about the word epistemology. It was on homosexuality, and you can be sure we used the title of Nietzsche's great book, The Gay Science. And that was the title of the symposium. And it was a classic, I think a classic, on how to, how to think critically and carefully about homosexuality. Then we had another one which is similarly inspiring to me as I remember it, on humor and the epistemology of humor. And again, the title is another one I loved, which was Ridio Ergo Sum. And for those of, you, those of you who are not Latin scholars, I laugh, therefore I am not cogito. Uh, I, I mentioned Gravity's Rainbow. We had a marvelous session on dreams and how to analyze dreams. The pioneering research worker, at least in greater Boston, is Alan Hobson in experimental work on dreams. And Alan, who's still working, uh, I've just come back from a week in Vienna and he was there the week before me. Uh, um, and Adolf Greenbaum was his commentator. Uh, this was a, a criti critical evening on the nature, remember, the, the, the classic work of Freud on the interpretation of dreams. This was a philosophy of science critique of the interpretation of dreams. Uh, Mike Matthews from Australia. Oh, Edgar Zilsel, Z-I-L-S-E-L. -E Edgar Zilsel uh, ended his life tragically in 1944, but was a pioneering worker in what we can loosely call the historical sociology of science. Namely, how come Western science? What is there about the Western civilization 
which produced, in the end, modern science. Um, and his work was picked up by Joseph Needham, the, the pioneering scholar on the science and civilization of China. So this was an opening. Then we had a, a similar opening up of uh, Frege and discussions of Frege led by Jean Van Heyenort, uh, whose name you should know. Um, one more in, in, this, in this group. Um, Karl Popper was, was a visiting professor at Brandeis and uh, he wanted to come to BU a lot because he hated smoking and we offered him a smoking free context. So he came to BU a lot and we held a symposium in honor of Karl Popper and became friends with Popper, although intellectually not so friendly. And uh, one of the chief papers, which is worth my mentioning, was by a Yugoslav Marxist humanist named Mihailo Markovic, a dear man who recently died. Uh, Markovic's approach to Popper then was reflected in the Soviet Union when the Soviet analytic philosophers took up Popper. And when I was visiting Moscow one time, they said to me, tell us about the Popper Symposium at Boston University. And it was about Mikhailo Markovich. Now, this kind of outreach to get across to different viewpoints showed itself in the way Marx and, Marx, Wartowski, Marx and I tried to develop the Boston studies. I just want to list, read to you a list of the volumes of the Boston studies, which, if you look at them, illustrate this point. <clears throat> the first one that I am so proud of was Italian studies in the philosophy of science, edited by Maria Luisa Della Chiara uh, at, from Firenze. I won't name everybody. Uh, followed by Greek studies in the philosophy of science, edited by Pantelis Nikolakopoulos. Then several volumes, I think four, of Israeli studies in philosophy of science. Recently, uh, I mean about two years ago, French studies in philosophy of science. Then we had very early in the 60s, two volumes of Polish studies in philosophy of science. One volume devoted to Polish studies in the philosophy of the natural sciences, edited by uh, Sławik Krajewski, and one on philosophy of the social sciences, edited by Faget. <laughs> oh. Then recently a volume, which is a little odd to most people, Estonian studies in philosophy of science. And I tried to get Latvian and Lithuanian, but I was unable to. Then a, a, f a rather fabulous volume of Turkish studies, which combined what we wanted, namely Turkish studies in modern philosophy of science, very sophisticated, and traditional topics, Turkish studies. We have three volumes of Chinese origin, namely uh, one specially devoted to the history and philosophy of science in the historical civilization of China, and one on contemporary work in philosophy of science in China. And then we have a volume, that, that's two, and a volume of Taiwan studies in philosophy of science. It always seemed to Marx and me, we better have Taiwan explicitly and recognize it and not take sides. And it turns out this is a wonderful volume on Taiwan studies and accepted as such on the mainland. We have a very nice volume of Japanese studies uh, in which the, one of the chief papers is by a Jesuit philosopher who was the head of the major Catholic university in Japan and wrote a marvelous paper on epistemology and quantum theory. Uh, and uh, again, uh, Yugoslav studies in the philosophy of science 
edited by a leading Serb, co-edited by a leading Croatian. Uh, the Croatian uh, and Serbs were good friends, and it's a tragedy, no, they're both dead. And so was their Yugoslavia. Um, we had many celebrations of individuals. There are more national volumes, but I've told you enough. Uh, we celebrated individuals, whether these were Festschriften, that is writings, or celebrations like this one, in, in person, or whatever. Uh, I just want to name the people who we celebrated with, with this kind of celebration. Well, the most important, I suppose, would be Wartowski himself, Greenbaum himself, Mario Bunger. Oh, but let's go into history. Popper, Karl Popper. Let's go deeper into history. We have a splendid volume, I think it's splendid, on Spinoza and the sciences. Notice, and the sciences. The point of this was to say that philosophy of science concerned with any given philosopher, especially a great philosopher with a well-established text. Uh, uh, we want to know how that philosopher related to the science of his or her time. Not today, but his or her time. So we have a great volume. I think it's a great volume, don't you? Yeah. The co-editor is over there on the side. Uh, co-editor. Uh, uh, anyway, on Spinoza. Another one on Goethe, which really reached out across a big gap. Goethe and the sciences. Hegel and the sciences. Nietzsche, two volumes on Nietzsche and the sciences. Striking, striking volume because of the overlap between Nietzsche and the logical positivists. Hansen, Norwood Russell Hansen, Marjorie Green. Oh, here's one, Maimonides and the Sciences, with a major symposium jointly with the Hillel House and uh, the colloquium uh, as the base for it. Maimonides, the rational. Maimonides trying to reach out beyond the literalism of the rabbinic literature and the neo-Aristotelianism of his Arabic context the wonderful attempt to, to reach out to Maimonides and recognize Maimonides' wonderful attempt to reach out himself. <clears throat> celebration of Reichenbach, a splendid celebration, I think splendid, of Ernst Mach, and one on our colleague, Erezim Kohak. Now, finally, uh, if I can find my note, <clears throat> yes. We we had we had some trouble putting things together. I'm trying to make a silly joke here. Uh, we were asked what our methods were. And my major assistant at the time, now Professor Katie Platt, uh, Catherine Platt of Babson, she gave a little speech about my method as a director and uh, that of Marx Wartowski. And the whole of her talk was condensed in saying, method? <laughs> With a question mark. So it, it was very difficult to call an institution like this an institution in any sociological sense. Uh, we had a, uh, a meeting at one point on editing and critical editing. And I, I brought the, the poster that was circulated on, on critical editing. This was March, this is late, 1993. But just listen to the sessions and you'll see what the outreach meant in practice. I won't name the people, just the topics. On the problems of archives and editing, scrolls from the several dead seas. Lovely title. Oh, I'll tell you who the paper that was. That was Yako Hintiker. 
Yako, who's not always known for good humor, he's sometimes tough, but that was a great paper. The Santayana edition. Editing Lorenz, Einstein, and Pauli with a very interesting paper on how this is done by John Stachel. Uh, editing the Pauli correspondence. Oh, on Heidegger. There's a name we wouldn't expect. Hans Martin Sass, Inept Disciples. Betraying the Cause of the Master, a hermeneutical critique of the not-so-critical edition of Martin Heidegger. Well, that excited discussion. <laughs> and then Ted Kiesel, an American uh, phenomenologist, Heidegger's Gesamtausgabe, an international scandal of scholarship. So this was a very hot and debated, and we had commentators, on the other side. Then, in the morning session of Friday, this was March 19th of 1963, we had a session on Wittgenstein in which Judson Webb, Judd is in the back there, another historical figure, uh, he's laughing at me, uh, on Wittgenstein. And the speakers were Anthony Kenny and again, Jaco Hinterke. On Girdle with John Dawson, A Meeting of Minds, the Girdle Editorial Project. On Leibniz, Heinrich Shepherds. Now everybody should know that publishing the collected works of Leibniz has been going on for some 250 years. So this was a, a, a progress report. <laughs> one more topic from that same, this is all one, one major session of the colloquium. One more, on Ernst Cassira, on editing Cassira's unpublished papers and technical and philosophical perspectives. Now, I had had the great luck as a graduate student of studying with Cassira, and these two guys who had discovered Cassira's unpublished papers totally dumbfounded me, and we had a marvelous discussion of what to do about Cassira's life work. It still hasn't been solved. Um, and then finally, translating and editing across cultures, experiences with the Boston Studies. Um, another example like that, and I'll stop in a moment. Uh, Fred Tauber helped a lot. We had a session called by him, The Elusive Synthesis, namely Aesthetics and Science. Really a quite profound title. The chief, the chief paper that I remember was by a mathematician at MIT, Giancarlo Rota, and his title was, Is Mathematics Beautiful? Hilda Hein, a uh, philosopher uh, now at, at Holy Cross, the art of displaying science. She's a, a veteran of the great Oppenheimer Science Museum in, in, in Berkeley. And then our colleague in the physics department who's an international specialist on it, Eugene Stanley, on beauty and fractals. And then a woman from Paris, Catherine Chevalier, uh, physics and Art, Scott Gilbert, Being and Becoming, The Aesthetics of Developmental Biology, followed by Sohocha Sarkar, who should be known here, Form, Function, and the Molecularization of Biology, and Larry Holmes, Beautiful Experiments in the Life Sciences, <clears throat> ending that day on aesthetics, or more than a day, no, a day, no, two days, Ending with Steve Gould, Stephen Jay Gould, with a wonderful paper on Goethe. And David Cohn, K-O-H-N, on the aesthetic construction of Darwin's theory. 
Well, you can see what a marvelously rich time that must have been. Indeed, it was. Uh, <clears throat> final remark about politics. The politics of the Boston Colloquium all the way has been open. But I think one would have to say open and liberal, open and leftist, critical leftist. I've always called myself a critical humanist Marxist. Marxism about issues where Marxism is relevant, not on issues where Marxism is not relevant, but where it is relevant, be humanist and be critical. When I gave a eulogy for Marx Wartowski, which is what I want to end with, I quoted a passage from Bertrand Russell that Marx and I felt deeply about. This is Russell. Three passions, simple but overwhelmingly strong, have governed my life. The longing for love, the search for knowledge, and unbearable pity for the suffering of mankind. I was recently in a discussion on happiness among a group of psychotherapists. Uh, I, I was there as a friendly critic. Uh, and one of the decisions was that there's two forms of, of happiness. One is, just putting it in a word, one is micro. And that's possible to have personal happiness even while you're suffering macro, suffering at these evils besetting mankind. Anyway, Russell concludes after the three passions, love, knowledge, and pity. He says, this has been my life. I have found it worth living and would gladly live it again if the chance were offered me. That's in the beginning of his autobiography. That sounds like Otto Neurath and Rudolf Carnap and Hans Reichenbach. There's one more thing, and Abner has left the room, and I don't know whether, I did not get his permission. I want to read a poem apropos of the politics of philosophy of science. I want to read a poem written by Abner Shimoni. <clears throat> He wrote it for Marx Wartowski's 65th birthday. The title of the poem is To Athena, the Goddess. In spite of cultural inhibitions against praying to pagan deities and philosophical inhibitions against praying at all, I humbly present a petition because our need is great. Turn a deaf ear to those who would constitute you guardian of the military industrial complex and reveal to those who worship you as goddess of war and goddess of wisdom that they can no longer have it both ways, war and wisdom. Let the quiet voice of your servant Thucydides be audible through the din of fanatics in the bleak landscape of our century restore the sacred olive groves. It's appropriate today. In recent years, I have visited China a number of times, and my friend Marx hoped to join me there before long. A Chinese custom comes to me now, in the middle of all the historical figures, when a good comrade dies, it has been said that he or she has gone to see Marx. And so Mao and Zhou Enlai, and even in recent days it was said about Deng Xiaoping, he's gone to see Marx. Now I have three Marxes in my life. Karl, Groucho, and my own beloved Marx Wartowski. How wonderful and miraculous and surprising 
and absolutely out of this world it would be for me when my time comes to go to see my hour marks in a transcendental, to see him in a transcendental bazooki dance, dancing with the angels in heaven. Marx was our spirit of this colloquium. Down here on earth, our Marx, our dancing philosopher, who lived a life of emotional depth and clear reason, he was Dionysus and Apollo. It was a joy to be with him. Thank you. Yeah. I was wondering the following from this fabulous presentation, that as you spent all of these years doing all of this outreach and enlarging the scope of philosophy, no. when you looked out over the, what was happening elsewhere in philosophy of science, <coughs> in Minnesota, in Pittsburgh, in Indiana, in the journal that you gave money to, did you find that you were swimming against the tide? Did you think that other places were enlarging the scope of philosophy? Good question, thank you. Uh, to some extent, the tide has turned in different directions. I think there is a tide. There is a movement uh, to recognize varieties of cultural comparison. There is a movement to say that Comparative analysis is still a method worth using, but the tide is analytically focused and rather narrow. So to some extent, the answer is yes. We were opening doors and opening windows and letting air flow through and other places were not in general, but we were always respected and invited. So it's hard to... The profession is a very tolerant and democratic profession. It's just that most people were on a different tide, different direction. But as I've traveled around the world, and I've tr traveled a lot, uh, in places I haven't mentioned, South America, etc., cetera, um, the Boston Colloquium, due to the variety of programs, is well known. You know. So, I don't know. We're not isolated, but we're not in the general tribe. But there's another thing to say about that. In Vienna and Berlin, and in the beginning, in the 30s, the movement toward philosophy of science was anti-metaphysical and anti-orthodoxy. Not only anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, anti-Protestant, anti all kinds of, and political uh, orthodoxy. So at that time, this, call it a movement or a trend, was definitely looking toward a revision of society. Whereas philosophy of science in America, in the emigration, has been neutral and has been as useful to the powers that be as any logic or whatever. So it's not, by and large, not politically committed. Carnap, Neurath, Frank, they were politically committed to a liberal revision of society, but not in any political party, not in a party sense. You know. um, where does Thomas Kuhn belong in this story? I didn't hear his name. I find it hard to understand. Could you repeat the question? Where does Thomas Kuhn belong in this um, uh, yeah. agenda? Because for my generation, he was very important, and I didn't hear his name at all. Yeah, uh, I didn't mention Kuhn and several others, a good many others, uh, because they came somewhat later. Uh, Kuhn, Kuhn was a very supportive figure and spoke here quite a lot. Um, and he entertained 
in his own debates, uh, especially with Popper, but in his own debates, he entertained all the issues that I've talked about. So it's just an omission due to the period I was covering. Kuhn was one of, one of us, you might say. Yeah. Why did Indiana get Charles Saunders' purse? And what did Indiana what? Why did Indiana University get Sa Charles Saunders' purse? And there was none or very little in the Boston Colloquium. I, I have no idea why they got it except for money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was not an intellectual decision. It was a decision of prestige in the academic world. Peirce, of course, was enormously respected by the European philosophers of all sorts and so on. Abner, I read your poem to Athena. Thank you. And I said it was still relevant. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi. Um, in 1997, the Boston Studies did one of the very first collected volumes in the philosophy of chemistry. And I wonder if you could say a word about some of the other fields that you've helped to create in the philosophy of science. An earlier question referred to some of the broadening of the discipline of what had been philosophy of physics and philosophy of biology. And I wonder if you could uh, uh, list a, a few of the other fields that you've helped to found. I th yes, I, I could, but it would take too long. But uh, uh, I brought some volumes with me just to show that they exist. Um, Helping to establish philosophy of chemistry as a legitimate branch of philosophy of science was a pleasure. And came to us out of the sky. We didn't, we didn't plan hardly anything. Almost everything came out of spontaneous combustion. Uh, we also, I think, held the first, I think the first serious development in philosophy philosophy of literature. I think the, the session on Gravity's Rainbow was an example, but then there's a society of literature and science which followed upon this. Um, I have here a, a new volume of Boston Studies on the social and economic roots of the scientific revolution, which is a study of the text of Boris Hessen, the famous text from the Soviet delegation to London in 1931, I think, on the social and economic roots of Newton's Principia. What a lovely title for a Marxist paper, The Social and Economic Roots of Newton's Principia. Fantastic, what a claim. But it turns out to be a very subtle and careful analysis, and in many respects, quite inadequate. But a, but a brilliant, well, anyway, it's worth talking about. And it was criticized uh, in the 30s, in exile, uh, not in Soviet Union, uh, by Henrik Grossmann, uh, not well known. And anyway, we've been trying to get the Marxist thesis about the social and economic contextual causation for the existence of science into some kind of legitimate and responsible form. Now, there's been many attempts at doing that, and mo many of you will know names like Bernal. And, and anyway, uh, Hessen's classic paper never received the full treatment it should, and now it has, as a volume of Boston Studies. So I'm very, uh, very the editor's a good old friend of ours, and from Germany and now in Israel, and I'm very pleased about that. So that's two examples. I think it may not have been the first, but one of the first philosophy of science sessions devoted to philosophy and methodology of economics was, was held here. That would have been 67, I think. And after that came the journal, Philosophy and Economics, and many sessions, of course, of the Philosophy of Science Association followed this pattern. 
many open sessions. The opening up of philosophy of science to different specialties, that's what that question really leads to, and thank you for it. Yeah. I think in that sense, the Boston Colloquium has been a, a seed, uh, not, not an accomplishment, but uh, pr pr provocateur, maybe. Yeah, provocateur. Uh, but provocateur in another sense. We, we tried in this context of uh, the Cold War to reach out across communist capitalist boundaries. And we had uh, many, uh, many, by which I mean something like four or five different sessions with anti-communist, pro-communist, no matter what kind of communist, people speaking. That's that wonderful old joke of the policeman who's beating a, a striker and saying, goddamn communist. And the guy says, I'm an anti-communist. And the policeman replies, I don't care what kind of a communist. You know. <laughs> you know. I think that I think my time is up. <laughs>